You don't need a PhD in economics from Berkeley to know that a little bit of supply and a lot of demand leads to one thing, and that would be a big price. Okay, it doesn't always lead to a $50 billion price or $82.9 billion. That was the valuation of the secondary market, according to Shares Post back in January. Now it's back down to $52.3 billion, again, according to Shares Post today. But there are two things that Facebook valuation mania proves. First, that fools seem willing to rush in despite scant information about Facebook, its earnings, its balance sheet, its cash flow, and its financials. And secondly, and maybe more importantly, that early investors and insiders seem quite willing to get out. So, Corey, do these sales mean an IPO is more likely, less likely? Does it even matter? Well, these days perhaps, and for this company especially, an IPO might just be irrelevant. I mean, the insiders with vested stock seem to have some liquidity, unlike ever before. And institutional investors who want to be able to get a piece of Facebook, well, thus far, Facebook's been able to give that to them, and they've been able to avoid the public scrutiny of the financials that an IPO might otherwise bring, but enjoy the secrecy that only private companies enjoy. Thanks, Corey. Let's expand the conversation now with a couple of guys who know a lot about these hot pre-IPO companies. John Battelle is founder, chairman, and CEO of Federated Media, and Tom Giles leads the Bloomberg News technology team here in San Francisco. Thank you both for joining us. So, John, let me start with you. What are the implications of having shares in the hands of a growing number of investors? Well, certainly one of the things you have to think about is when you get past a certain number, you have to start declaring your financials. Facebook's basically there. Um, there is a lot of information about the company that is available, but not enough for it to be a public stock or for it to be traded as a public stock in terms of information. So there is limited amount of information, a lot of demand, uh, and that's, as Corey points out, why the price on the private markets is so high. Tom, we hear these valuations changing every day. Do the valuations really even matter? Well, they help. They give a little bit of a sense before an IPO of, of what at least some buyers value the company at. Um, this is a company that, uh, you know, as, as the guests have already been talking about, we don't know a lot, but what we do know is there's a, a, a user base of more than 500 million people. We have advertisers who are clamoring to get their message onto Facebook to reach that growing audience that's very highly engaged. Um, and there's enough people who believe in the story to ascribe a value that high to those shares. Tom, let me ask you also, uh, one of the things you look at here is how much uh, people read certain stories. These valuation stories popular people want to know or they sort of dismiss it because it is a private market trade? Well, no, there's, there's a lot of interest in reading about what, what Facebook is worth, what it may be valued at, when it's going to IPO, whether it's going to IPO, who the bankers may be. I mean, every aspect of Facebook and when you guys is those, picked apart. And when you do those stories, the reaction is what? Lots of readers? Sure. We, we, we get a lot of interest. Where are you going with this, Corey? Well, my question is, you put these stories up, and it seems like readers flock to them, and people really have a desire for this kind of information. Yes? No? No No question about it. Look, right now, privately held companies, we know so little about them. The public is very hungry for any tidbit of information on every aspect of what they do. For example, Facebook has already said, as our number of, of investors grows, and once it reaches that crucial 500 threshold, they're going to be forced to start disclosing more information about themselves. And, and, and they've said that's going to happen in 2012, whether they've, dis whether they've gone ahead with an IPO or not. Right. Their number of shareholders is going to increase so significantly by that point. John, there are founders and early investors that are walking around with a lot of shares in their pockets. When do they sell? Well, I think it's entirely up to each one of them. And I think that's what may be getting lost here is, for example, there was a rumor today that someone wanted to unload 10 million shares. Um, well, that person may be just interested in buying a sports team. And that may have absolutely nothing to do with whether or not that person wants to hold for the long term in Facebook. So if you want to buy the shares, I mean, how do you buy them? Is it as simple as just going and tracking down the seller? Not really. There's a, there's a whole market that is created uh, that you have to go through actually a process in order to do it. And it's, it's, it's not without its own you know, regulations and procedures. Um, it's not simple. You have to be accredited, for example. Um, but it is a very hot market right now. I would say perhaps overheated. But I think everyone is making this trade. Facebook it has the same narrative that Google had 10 years ago. And people believe that no matter what the price, Facebook's going to be worth a lot more than any of the prices that are currently being quoted on the secondary market in the coming years.
John, let me ask you about what this does to the Silicon Valley CEOs. You talk to so many of these people. How does this secondary market and the evolution of this change what the CEOs have to think about? I think it depends on what kind of CEO you're talking about. Uh, if you're talking about a company that has its own critical mass and is on its way to becoming public, frankly, I think it's something of a distraction to those CEOs. Tom, can, can you tell us a little bit more about what actually goes on behind the scenes in terms of the negotiation, how uh, sellers find the buyers and convince them to, to sell them the shares? Yeah, it's not a very straightforward process the way we would expect. Uh, the way we would expect when we go to Fidelity, for example, and 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 place it place an order to buy some shares. Um, this is happening in secondary markets. Some of these agreements happen between the sellers and the buyers directly. Some of them go through shares post. Uh, some of them go through other other intermediaries like that. And we've also seen investment banks also get get into this come into the game as well. Goldman Sachs set up the special purpose vehicle uh, for certain investors, non-U.S. investors, so that they could get a piece of Facebook. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of different ways to skin this cat. Um, they're just not the ways that you and I know of in, in publicly traded companies where there's a lot of transparency and a lot of attention and scrutiny to it. John, let me ask you also sort of on the same topic, venture capitalists when we see guys like Mark Andreessen and the like in later rounds getting invested in these companies, does that change the nature of venture capital that it sort of has many sort of different tiers and do you see that happening throughout the valley? Yes, absolutely. Uh, what it offers is, an, is a chance for uh, venture capitalists who may have missed one of the traditional A, B, C, D and mezzanine rounds to cover their bets, so to speak, by getting into a hot company pre-IPO. And that's something that really they couldn't do uh, in previous years and I think it's a strategy that a lot of companies are starting, venture companies are starting to employ. One of the interesting things that we were talking about earlier is that you have actually been approached uh, for secondary shares of your company, yes. right? Tell yes. me about how that works. Well, uh, I can't say too much about that because I do run a, uh, you know, I'm now executive chairman of a, of a private company. Um, but suffice to say, you know, once you've been, as we have, uh, you know, private for six years and growing every one of those years, people come, people go, they hold shares and they're interested in for various reasons. Maybe they want to buy a house, maybe not a sports team, um, and, and they want uh, liquidity. And so they're looking to the secondary markets for that liquidity. John, about that, I mean, there's a certain kind of company that seems to be garnering all this attention. The number of, of companies that, that represent the private market trading seems limited. Do you get a sense of what other companies that aren't involved are saying? Again, because you talk to so many, I wonder what they're saying. Well, I think everybody's sort of trying to get their head around this new market and trying to understand and rationalize it. My own view is that uh, we don't have enough information, we don't have a track record, and frankly, I don't think, given what we just went through in the financial markets, it's a particularly good idea to create a robust market that is either poorly regulated or not well understood by those who are getting into it. Um, and so hopefully we will start to you know, get our arms around this to the point of, of, of getting to some rational understanding. All right, thank you so much. John Battelle, Federated Media, and Tom Giles, head of our Bloomberg tech team. Thank you so much for joining us.